Uh, you may have heard the story about a man in the 1950s who was travelling in one of those old department store elevators. And, and, and you might remember, maybe you, don't, you might know, that back in those times, many elevators were still operated by a man sitting inside on a little chair. Yeah. And in this particular situation, uh, there was a young African-American boy operating this elevator. And as the man came into the lift, this boy said to him, I can take you to any floor that you want, but only Jesus can take you to heaven. Oh. Now, this young boy would say this to anyone who traveled in his lift. He'd say it every time until one day, someone asked him why he said this. And he said, I'm a nobody telling everybody about somebody who can save anybody. <laughs> now, what this boy did, was not that unusual. I mean, after all, Christians have been doing it for 2,000 years. At the very beginning of the book of Acts, the risen Lord Jesus says to his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. To be a witness means to testify to something that you believe is true. And Jesus commanded his followers to testify to what they believed to be true about him. That he was a somebody who could save anybody. Now today we're, we're beginning a series in the book of Acts. So over the next couple of months we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 8 to 12. And we've called this series The Spreading Flame. Here is a series as we look at a book about the growth of the early church and how people obeyed Jesus' command to be his witnesses. And we're, we're calling this a spreading flame because it's like the spark of the gospel caught fire and this flame spread throughout the known world. And the book of Acts can be outlined at the very start in chapter 1, verse 8, as we, we saw. This, this verse is kind of like the contents verse, the contents page of the whole book of Acts as Jesus' followers were first of all his witnesses in Jerusalem and then afterwards to Judea and Samaria and, and to the ends of the earth, to the Roman earth at that stage. Now we saw last year in, in autumn, in Acts chapter 1 to 7, that witness was in Jerusalem. But the gospel did not stop at Jerusalem. It was not constrained there, it went further. It went further beyond Jerusalem to, to, to Samaria, to the rest of the Roman world, like a stone that's thrown into a pond and the ripples travel outwards. That, that was the spread of the gospel. And it's in studying this, this gospel and, and, and its effect on the early church and the mission of the early church that we can ask ourselves again that question, what type of a community do we want to be? As that early Christian community impacted the world around them, how can we impact the world around us? Uh, today, as we look at how the gospel for the first time spread outside of Jerusalem to Samaria, we're going to see three things about gospel growth. We're going to see organic growth, we're going to see authentic growth, but then we'll also see counterfeit growth. Now, what do I mean by organic growth? Well, the beginning of chapter 8 tells us the reason why the gospel spread from Jerusalem. Verse 8, On that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. On that day, that day was the trial and execution of Stephen. He was put on trial for proclaiming the gospel, and he was executed. And that execution began a great persecution of Jesus' followers, organized and orchestrated by a man named Saul, who would later become the Apostle Paul. Now, you would think that this persecution would put an end to that young Christian movement, that they would be scattered and, 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 and fearful and intimidated into silence. But instead, this great persecution led to a great dispersion, and this great dispersion led to a great evangelization. And so we're told in verse 4, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. I wonder if you noticed that. Even though the apostles stayed in Jerusalem, that wasn't the end of gospel proclamation. You'd think 
that since the apostles had stayed in Jerusalem, that the gospel would be constrained to Jerusalem. Because after all, the apostles were the leaders. They were the ones personally trained and appointed by Jesus himself. They were the ones who made the decisions, the training. If, if gospel ministry uh, happened, it happened through them. But that's, that's not the case. Because we're told that those who were forced to scatter preached the word wherever they went. Gospel proclamation wasn't done by just a select few. It was done by everyone, by, by, by thousands of people. That's what I mean by organic growth. It was spontaneous. It was dynamic. It was, it was natural. These scattered Christians took the life-changing message of Jesus wherever they went. They embodied it. They lived it out. They began to talk about it all the time. You could say the wind of persecution fanned the flames of the gospel as it spread. Now, a great example of Acts 8 is in the 20th, in the 20th century is, is mainland China. Because we, we know that, that very often the gospel spreads because of difficulty and persecution. And a great example of that is mainland China in the 20th century. In 1949, um, the Communist Party came to power. And as, as a result, 637 missionaries of the inland mission, uh, China Inland Mission were, were obliged to leave. And it seemed like a total disaster, that that would be the end of Christianity in China. After all, these missionaries brought all the money, they brought all, all the training. But it wasn't a disaster. Despite the difficulties, local Chinese Christians brought the gospel everywhere. And many people say that over the next 50 years, the church in China grew 50-fold. Incredible growth. But last year, I was on a Zoom seminar, seminar led by a man called Oz Guinness. Uh, Oz Guinness is the great, great, great grandson of Arthur Guinness, the famous Dublin brewer. Um, mm -hmm. Oz Guinness was born in China to missionary parents, but he's better known as an author and a scholar and an expert on, on world missions. And uh, he said something during that seminar that caught my attention. It happened during question time. It, it seemed like a throwaway line. Someone asked him a question about the increasing levels of persecution today in the world against Christians. And Os Guinness said, well, the greatest threat to the church is not persecution. It's modernism. By modernism, he meant the distractions of modern culture. Consumerism, which means that, 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 that people will sit loosely to church commitment. They'll just hop around from place to place and never really settle. Consumerism, he says. Or, or technology, which means we're getting discipled more and more by our phones and screens rather than being discipled by other Christians around us. Or convenience. That as a result of convenience, we have a really low tolerance threshold about involvement, about volunteering, about serving. We just don't want to be bothered too much because we're too used to the modern conveniences. Os Guinness said modernism is a greater threat to the church today than persecution. Because the gospel always moves away when people are too comfortable with it. It always moves away when people are too comfortable with it. Churches lose the gospel when they begin to take the gospel for granted. Now the extraordinary thing about the early church is that everyone, everyone was involved in this proclamation of the gospel. And look, there might be all sorts of reasons why we feel hesitant in, in sharing the gospel towards others. Um, maybe there's this craving to, to fit in with, with friends and colleagues. We don't want to rock the boat too much. Um, it could be the, the fear of being labelled as fanatical or fundamentalist. It could be just our own personal shyness. So it could be a mild insecurity about the credibility of the gospel. We don't want to be thought of as wrong or proved wrong. We don't want to give a wrong answer. Uh, we can sometimes fall into the trap that when it comes to people becoming Christians, it's about us. It's, it's, it's all about us. We have to give the right answers. We have to not make mistakes. We have to, it's somehow all up to us. And that can be very intimidating and sometimes lonely. But as a result, we might keep our faith under the radar. We might just keep quiet. But the book of Acts teaches us that in every, concept, in every circumstance, whether, whether small or great, God is in control of the unstoppable spread of his gospel. In Acts chapter 18, when Paul is going through a really difficult time in Corinth, God speaks to him and says, do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent, 
for I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. God goes with you. God is with us. Remember Jesus said to his disciples before he ascended to heaven, I am with you always to the very end of the age. God goes with us. He orders events to happen. He, he, he puts hunger into people's hearts for the truth of his gospel. And so what might it look like for us to be witnesses of the gospel? It's not that we should artificially force the gospel into every single conversation that we're in. Uh, but we should be encouraged to let our faith rise naturally to the surface. Uh, what is real within us should be given visual expression, regardless of, of who is, is listening to us. I've heard it sometimes called um, God talk. God talk is that natural, spontaneous, warm references, passing references to your faith in everyday conversations. It's not necessarily designed to initiate conversations about Christianity. It's simply part of being a natural and relaxed Christian. So whenever you have those normal conversations and topics might come up about the news or about business or politics, um, that's God talk. Uh, you, you, you might talk about what you've been doing or the joys and struggles in life and as a result people see your worldview. They begin to see the lens through which you, you see the world. That, that they, they, they begin to see how you respond to other people's needs. And so maybe as they confide in you about their own needs, you might say to them, hey, I'll, I'll remember to pray for you about that. It's taking everyday opportunities to give expression to your faith. That's what the early Christians did. It was warm, it was spontaneous, it was intentional, it was prayerful. It was organic. So we see organic growth, but next we see authentic growth. Verse 5, uh, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks and pure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. And so there was great joy in that city. Often in the book of Acts, Luke, the author of the book of Acts, will make a general statement and then follow it up with a specific example. We just saw that general statement in verse 4 about how when people were scattered, they proclaimed the good news wherever they went. That general statement is now followed up by an example, with Philip going into Samaria. Now up until then, this early Christian community had been made up almost completely of Jewish people who become Christians. And it's hard for us to, ex to conceive how extraordinary it is for these early believers to go into Samaria. Because the hostility between Jews and Samaritans had gone on for a thousand years. For Jewish people, the Samaritans were an unpopular people living in an unpopular place. A, a, a little bit of history. Um, after King Solomon the kingdom of Israel split into two. In the north, you had Israel. In the south, you had Judah. Uh, in the north, the capital Samaria was set up, and that, that became hostile to Jerusalem in the south. Now, after a while, the Assyrians came, and they, 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 they destroyed Israel, the northern kingdom. They took many of its, uh, of its people off into captivity, never to return again. And pagan foreigners came in, in and settled. And the remaining Jews intermarried with these pagan foreigners and they became a kind of hybrid race of people. They also built a rival temple in a place called Mount Gerizim so that people wouldn't have to go down to the temple in Jerusalem in order to worship. And then they, 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 they cast off big chunks of the Old Testament. They didn't, they didn't believe in big parts of the Old Testament except for the first five books of the Bible. And so the Samaritans despised the Jews as a kind of hybrid people in race and religion. Remember, Jewish people were told that to associate with Gentiles, to even touch Gentiles, made them ritually unclean, defiled them. But, but Samaritans were viewed as being far worse than Gentiles. However, you may remember that Jesus loved the Samaritans. You may remember in John 4 that Jesus spoke to a Samaritan woman at the well and offered her eternal life. You may remember Jesus healed 
a, a Samaritan who was a leper. You may remember Jesus told that famous parable of the good Samaritan. And Jesus told his followers that they will be witnesses for him in Samaria. And Philip heard, and Philip obeyed. And because Philip loved Jesus, Philip also loved the Samaritans. Now I said that the Samaritans were unpopular, but that doesn't mean they were unworthy, because after all, no one is worthy of the gospel. We are all unworthy of the gospel. The God who sovereignly organises the proclamation of his gospel also graciously brings the gospel to the unworthy. The Bible says that when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't die for us when we took notice of him. He didn't die for us when we embarked on a course of moral self-improvement. He didn't die for us when we started turning up to church. Christ died for us when we were still sinners, when we were still proud, when we were still selfish and self-reliant. That's when Christ died for us. And we're told that many Samaritans heard this word of Christ dying for us and came to believe and were baptised. Now, you might have noticed something strange in this passage. <laughs> That's really, I think it's one of the strangest things in the New Testament, to be honest. When the apostles were told that the Samaritans believed in the word of God, in verse 14, we're told that some of the apostles, Peter and John, were sent down there to investigate. Now, one of the reasons why they went down there was that even though the Samaritans had heard and believed the gospel and been baptized, they hadn't, they hadn't yet received the Holy Spirit. Now, this doesn't happen anywhere else in the New Testament. When people believe, they believe because they have the Holy Spirit in them. And when they believe as an outward sign of that belief, they are baptised. Those things all go together. But here, it's like this two-stage thing. It's very unusual. You have the first stage, they, they, they believe and they're baptised. But then this second stage where afterwards the apostles have to come and investigate and, and lay hands upon them so that they receive the Holy Spirit. So what's going on? Well, the na most natural explanation of this delayed gift of the Holy Spirit is, is to see how it fits with the rest of how the New Testament understands people coming to faith. But then also to see how it fits within the context of the spread of the gospel. You see, remember, this is the first time that Christians are taking the word of God outside of Jerusalem. And apart from Jesus, it's the first time that people who aren't from a Jewish background are becoming Christians. And this is something that the early church were trying to get their head around. They're trying to understand it because beforehand, all the way through the Old Testament, the Jews were God's special people. They had the law and the covenants. They had the special relationship with God. And so now that people are outside of Judaism and they're coming into relationship with God through Jesus, what does this mean? You see, over the next few chapters in Acts, the, 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 this early Christian church was trying to work it out. As they see an Ethiopian become a Christian, as they see a pagan Roman centurion become a Christian, as they see this church sprout up in this Gentile city in Antioch, they're always asking the question, well, does that mean that anyone can be saved regardless of their background? You see, the gospel is crossing borders, it's, it's crossing social and racial, racial boundaries. So the gospel is being welcomed by Samaritans, but the question is, Will these new Samaritan Christians be welcomed by the Jewish Christians? Will these Christians welcome one another based on a common belief in the gospel rather than some social, cultural, religious or moral baggage? John Stott argues that it's reasonable to suggest that at this unique moment, God temporarily delays the Samaritans receiving the Holy Spirit so that the apostles could investigate it. When the, when the gospel goes out to this new place and it's received by these new people, the apostles who, who, who are trained and authorised, remember they were the ones who were appointed by Jesus, they were the ones who made all the decisions, they were the leaders, they were kind of like the accreditation board. And so when the gospel goes out to this new place and received by these new people, this accreditation board arrives and they do their compliance thing. They make sure that they have understood the correct gospel. 
that they have correct understanding, that they check and verify that the Samaritans are the real deal, that they are authentic followers in Jesus. And so the apostles could pray for the Samaritans, and it's at that point that belief and baptism is added to by the Holy Spirit. Now that's what the, the early Christians had to work out. And to be honest, it's still what we have to work out today, right? Um, if the gospel is for anyone, regardless of background, if it's for the Samaritans, if it's for those people that we don't like spending time with, if, if it's for the people that we, we even despise, if the gospel tells me that I'm unworthy and my enemy is unworthy and that we are all saved just by grace through faith, then that means that the gospel breaks down barriers between people. I can no longer look down on other people and say, you are unworthy. In fact, I have to look up and say, God, you have reached even me. And then I look around at people and say, I, I, I have something that you need to hear. I have this great gift. I have something great to share with you. Think about how that changes how, how you look at other people. So, for instance, when you come into a building like this and you walk down the aisle and you, and you go to a row and, and, and you see someone, and, 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 and do you say to yourself, there's someone who I don't like the look of, therefore I'm not going to sit next to that person? Or do you have a gospel perfection for that person, which enables you to say, I'm going to sit right down next to that person, even though I don't know that person, I'm going to get to know that person? Or in your own neighbourhood, or in your workplace? Do you find that there are certain types of people that you like and certain types of people that you don't like, but there is a gospel affection within you that makes you cross boundaries? You, you're intentional about making connections and sharing the reason for the hope that you have. That's what authentic gospel ministry looks like. So, we've seen authentic growth, but then lastly you see counterfeit growth. We've seen real faith, but Luke shows us an example of fake faith. In verse 9, we meet a man named Simon. Uh, Simon had a talent and he had a reputation. Simon was a sorcerer. And he did these magical things that made everyone amazed. And he had a following and he boasted and he made a name for himself. But like many of this other Samaritans, we're told in verse 13 that Simon heard the word and he believed it. He was baptised. And you might think that all's now well for Simon, that he's safe and secure. But when he sees Peter and John doing their thing and, and, and laying hands on people and they get the Holy Spirit, he's really impressed. And he thinks to himself, I'd like to be able to do that trick. And so he offers money to Peter and John so that he can have that same gift of giving the Holy Spirit to other people. And Peter looks at him and he sees straight through him. And he says in verse 20, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Peter sees straight through Simon. And he says, your heart is not right with God. You are captive to sin. It doesn't seem like Simon's probably understood the gospel. He thinks he can buy the gift of God with money. He thinks he can buy the Holy Spirit with money. But you can't buy it. You can't earn it. It's a gift. Salvation it is a gift. It seems as though Simon hasn't understood the gospel. Now, we don't know the end of Simon's story. We hope that the other Samaritans got around him and after a period of time, Simon actually did repent and he came to understand the proper gospel. But that's it. at this stage, he doesn't look like he's been changed. It's a fake faith. It's not the real thing. It's a counterfeit faith. Now, the question that we're supposed to ask is, why is this story here? I mean, Luke could have told other stories, but he doesn't. He tells this particular story. So why is it here? Well, I think it's to act as a warning to us. But with the spread of the gospel, there's also opposition to the gospel. Um, the opposition is not just persecution from outside the church. It's also counterfeit faith within the church. Those of you might remember Acts chapter 5 last year. Opposition within the church with the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Mm -hmm. Professing faith is not always possessing faith. Professing faith is not always authentic faith. 
And so what marks Simon out as a fake? I mean, he looked like the real deal from the outside, but Peter saw straight through him. And so what marked him out that we can recognise as a warning to us? Well, first of all, it seemed as though he had dead orthodoxy. He had dead orthodoxy. Many people can say, I believe in God. Tick. I believe in Jesus. Tick. I believe that he lived, died, and rose again. Tick. I can, I can mouth the words of the creed. Tick. But it's dead orthodoxy. Remember Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, some people will say to me, Lord, Lord, remember all these things that I've done to you, for you. And he would look at them and reply, surely I've never known you. I've never met you. I've held out my hand to you, but you never took it. It's possible to have dead orthodoxy. The second thing with Simon is that he seemed to just drift in with the crowd. How often that is easy to do. You have all these people coming to faith, these other Samaritans, and he does the same thing. You have a big crusade, Billy Graham, and he calls many people to come down to the fronts, and many people do, and many people follow. But not all stay in the faith. How easy it is just to drift in with everybody else. Now, the third thing is that Simon was never desperate. He never saw his need for Jesus as desperate. Even when he's told to repent, he tries to outsource it to Peter. Would you pray for me? He never deals with Jesus himself. He doesn't have a heart that is desperate for Jesus. Simon hasn't been changed by the gospel. He hasn't been gripped by the power of the gospel because chances are he believed in a tame, weak, anemic, unthreatening gospel. Uh, many years ago, I, I, I travelled to Uganda. And when I was in Uganda, I went uh, to a safari park that was right on the border of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, there was a river that separated this safari park with the Congo. And our group was standing on an embankment above this river, looking down on it. And in this river was a group, the collective noun I learned this week is a bloat, a bloat of hippos um, down there, only about 30 metres below us. And that unsettled me. Um, we had this guy who was with us, a, a delightful lady who was only about this big. And I asked her, aren't hippos like one of the most dangerous animals in Africa? And she said, no, they are the most dangerous animal in Africa. <laughs> and I said, aren't hippos, can't, aren't they really fast? And she said, yes, they can run faster than you. And I, I said, aren't we in incredible danger? And she said, no, I've got a gun. And I, and I looked at her gun and it looked very old and not nearly big enough and I was deeply unsettled because I'd seen hippos before but up until that point I'd just seen hippos in a zoo and there's a big difference between seeing tame hippos behind thick glass barriers and moats compared to seeing them in the wild untamed with not much between me and them and only me being protected by a small lady with an old gun. I was deeply unsettled. What I'm saying to you is this. There is an awesome and powerful gospel. But many Christians believe in a weak, tame, unthreatening and safe gospel. A gospel that does not change you. A gospel that does not demand anything from you. A gospel which allows you to stay the same. It's not a gospel that you're desperate for. It's not a gospel that you give anything for. It's not a gospel that you, you want to share to the people around you because it's a weak, tame, unthreatening, undemanding gospel. And Simon's story is frightening because here is a guy who's heard the gospel. He's seen the miracles. He's professed faith, but he was never converted. What he believed in was a fake and tame gospel. And it's every chance that that could happen to us. So, what is it that made these Christians want to be, want, want, want to be able to share this powerful gospel to the world around them? Wherever they went, even in the face of great danger, wherever they went, even to those people that ordinarily they would despise. It's because they were being obedient to Jesus' command and said, you will be my witnesses. Jesus saying, I want you to bear witness to the truth you know about me, to 
the life-changing power of the gospel. If you think that something is true, if you believe that Jesus' death and resurrection is true, and that truth is the most valuable truth that you have, and that truth has deeply changed you, then you will share that truth to others. You will say, like that young boy in the elevator, I'm nobody, telling everybody about a somebody who can save anybody. Thank you.